Hi everybody, I'm Maggie from Bound Crossing Library and I'm here today with Dane Smith to talk about Dungeons and Dragons combat with you all. Dane has been playing tabletop games for over 20 years and has a lot of experience for us. So we're going to jump right in and my first question is when you need to plan a fight in Dungeons and Dragons or any tabletop game, where do you start? For me, where I start is, is where, the, where it takes place, where the fight's going to happen, or at least where I think the fight is going to happen, right? Uh, as we all know, or we'll soon find out, you don't always know what your players are going to do or where they're going to lead you. Um, but I like to have an idea, right? So if they're in a, like, let's say a city, and I have this like cool ambush encounter where these guys are going to jump out of the alleyways and attack them. You know, I try to envision the the street level, what that would look like, the alleyways. You know, are they really well hidden or are they just guys kind of standing in the alleyway waiting to jump out? So for me, I think setting is probably the first place that I start, um, okay. especially because I feel like if you have a good idea for where it takes place, you can extrapolate on the fight itself. Cool. Um, on the player side, when you're in combat, what are the moves that you can make? There's a whole boatload of them, just to name a few. Uh, attack, which is basically you swing your weapon uh, or shoot your bow. You know, uh, Whatever weapon you have equipped, you can go ahead and use that in whatever way it's supposed to be used. You can cast a spell, of course, uh, if you're a spellcaster and have access to that. You can do the dash action, which is kind of what you're, you're sprinting or you're moving away at, at a good pace. Uh, the disengage action, which is where you can move away from an enemy without them being able to attack you back. Uh, the dodge action, which is basically you're, you're in anticipating a attack is going to come at you, and you're kind of readying yourself to move out of the way of it. Uh, the help action, which allows you to kind of help another creature complete a certain task. Um, the hide action, which lets you kind of... Uh, hide yourself, <laughs> obviously, you know, you're being stealthy, you're trying to get out of the, the eyesight of people. Uh, you can ready an action, which is kind of neat. Basically, what that allows you to do is if you, let's say you, you're a melee uh, attacky kind of character and you can't get to the person that you wanted to attack, you could hold an attack action for when they come near you and then you could still get that attack against them. Um, there's also the search action, which allows you to kind of look around, perceive something, look for something. Uh, and the use an object action, which allows you to like use an item or if you have a magical item that you have to activate, um, those sort of things. Now, there are some sub rules to each of these. Uh, I don't know how, how deep we want to go into it at this point, but uh, yeah, there, there are some nuance to these things, but that's that's basically what you can do. Excellent. Um, what do you think makes a combat encounter successful? Well, first and foremost, I think player fun and player engagement is really what, what matters most to me, at least. Um, and and so the thing that I, I base most of my success in, in tabletop games off of if my players or friends or, or strangers are having a good time. You know, if they've got grins on their face or they're getting into the action, they're having a good time, and you can kind of tell by their body language. Um, that's, I think, the first thing that I look for. Uh, but that being said, I think having a an idea of where the fight or the combat encounter takes place, I guess it doesn't have, even have to necessarily be a combat encounter, right? A social encounter, or a puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, knowing where that takes place and kind of the ins and outs of it, being prepared with that information so that I can kind of present it to the players in a straightforward manner that they can digest and have fun with. Um, on top of that, I think having a, a well thought out plan for what you want the combat to look like. So in the example I gave earlier of the uh, the guys jumping out of alleyways, right? Why are they there? Do the players have something that they want? Do the, are they paid to, you know, kind of hurt the players in some way, shape or form? You know, what was the reason that these guys are in these alleyways just waiting? Are they going to jump the next people who came along? And it just so happened to be our, our heroes. Uh, that sort of thing, I think, really kind of takes it up well, just a little notch. Um, so what do you do when a fight uh, is much harder or easier than you expected it to be? Well, there's a couple of things one can do. Um, I'll talk easier first because I feel like, ironically, that's probably the harder way <laughs> to swing with it. Uh, and I'll explain what, what I mean by that here in just a moment. So basically, if you've got a fight and you're like, oh, I'm going to throw like four goblins at them and they're going to they're going to have a really hard time, you know, because these goblins are crazy. And they're strong and whatnot. And they're kind of walking over the goblins. Well maybe, you know, one of the goblins tries to run away. And if the players can't stop this goblin from running away, uh, they then come back with more goblins. Or, you know, their their boss in the next room hears them and, you know, 
the challenge kind of increases from there. So it kind of takes it from a one-step fight to a two-step fight. You don't have to go from this room to the next room. And the guys in the next room are waiting for them, and they're, they're ready for them, uh, which might ratchet up that difficulty a little bit. Okay. Um, I, so I think that that's, that's one way that I kind of look for opportunities to scale the fight to the players to make it challenging for them, but not too much. It's, it is kind of a balancing act, so you got to be a little bit careful. Um, as far as making a fight, so it was easy to hard, making a fight hard to easy, uh, maybe, you know, getting into the head of your creature, of your monster, of your bad guy, whatever you want to call it, um, is the best way to do it for me, at least. So I, I like to think of, okay, this guy's a big brute. You know, he's not, not maybe the smartest person. He doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, he doesn't read a lot, doesn't go to his local library, uh, <laughs> just kind of, uh, swings away and is kind of a brute, if you will. Uh, so maybe he doesn't always think to do the optimal move. You know, maybe he's got an a couple of abilities okay. that he can use in a given fight and he doesn't use the one that's like the best in that situation because he just, he just wants to hit the guy. You know, he's not even thinking about it. He's just, ah, oh, I'm so mad. Bah, take that. Um, so that's one way you can kind of like dial that down a little bit. So rather than, okay. you know, having this like confident, uh, amazing fighter who's using their best abilities every chance they get. You've got this big guy who's like really strong and competent, but at the same time, maybe a little bit foolhardy, maybe a little bit, you know, rash and decides, Oh, I'm just going to hit him. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hit him with the, the big attack. I'm going to hit him with a smaller one. Cause they're not worth my time or, or what have you. So you can kind of like get into the mindset of the creatures that you're portraying as the game master uh, in order to sort of tailor the fight to your player's expectations. Excellent. Um, tell me a little bit about what AC is. So AC stands for armor class. It's awesome. Basically, it's <laughs> how hard or easy, uh, if you don't have a lot of it, your character is to hit or the, the enemy is to hit. So every every monster, uh, every creature, every character in at least for the, this for intents and purposes, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, they have an armor class. And basically what you do is you uh, roll to attack them. You add your modifiers, uh, which I think we can get into maybe a little bit later. But you add all the numbers that you need to add to it. And if that number meets or exceeds their armor class, you hit them. Uh, so basically, if I have an AC of 20, you roll a 10. You have a plus, tw uh, plus 11 to your attack. That's 21. So that obviously hits me. And then you roll your damage and you go, take that. Ah! And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Uh, what about uh, the challenge rating for monsters? Challenge rating is kind of interesting. Um, let me see if I can. I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I think it is in my head, but I want to make sure I, I don't lead you guys astray. If my memory serves, it's uh, the number, the level your characters would need to, uh, a, okay, the level a standard adventuring party which is four characters would need to be in order to have a challenging time but not be overwhelmed by a monster that sounds right to me <laughs> yeah i think they worded a little bit differently in the uh, the official books but uh, that's that's more or less how it works so basically if you've got a cr4 monster four level four adventurers should be able to defeat that okay if i'm thinking i think about that sounds right <laughs> Yeah. Um, what about hit points? And also, what happens when a player's character gets down to zero? Yeah. Depending on the game, I suppose. So every every you know being has a number of hit points. Um, you can think of this as health or life or, or any other number of uh, analog that you'd prefer. Uh, but basically, that's how much uh, vitality you have in your in your body. And once that reaches zero, you become unconscious. Um, and that can be that happen for a number of reasons. You know, damage uh, will do that really easily. <laughs> you'll you'll find you'll be like, oh, I've got tons of hit points. I'm fine. And then you get into some combat. And you're like, oh no, I'm unconscious. <laughs> um, once you drop to unconsciousness, that's where things get really really dicey. Uh, pun not intended. But you are <laughs> able at that point to start making what they call death saving throws. So essentially, what that is is you roll a d20. If it's a ten or above you succeed on your death saving throw. If it's a nine or below, you fail one. You've got three chances on both sides, three fails and three successes. Uh, if you reach three successes, you go to zero, you're stabilized, they call it, and you are just unconscious. You're not in any more danger unless something comes up and hits you again. Uh, but if you reach 
if you fail your three at that point you're dead and then that then things get a little bit crazy either you have to maybe make a new character or your friends have to go you know find a way to bring you back to life because uh, magic is awesome now what i will say on those death saving throws uh if you roll a one it's an automatic two failures so that could get real dicey if you if you you know roll once you fail and you roll again and you get a one well you're, you're done you're, you're dead unfortunately um, if you roll a nat 20, however, a 20 sided die, uh, a 20 on the 20 sided die, you are able to stabilize automatically. So it doesn't matter if you failed, know. however many or succeeded, however many you roll a nat 20 and you're, you're safe. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Now, if, if your buddy comes along and they heal you really quickly, you know, that you got a, an awesome friend who casts a cure spell or a heal spell on you, uh, then you just go back to the hit points that you would have from the heal, heal spell and you don't have to make any more death saving throws. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's good to have friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so aside from the enemies themselves, what elements do you use to add the excitement or danger of a fight? Oh, there's so many things you can do. You know, so once again, it does kind of come back to setting for me, uh, as m m much of it does. Uh, you, you basically can kind of set the stage as you want to. So maybe you know, in the, the alleyway example that I've been using a couple of times here, maybe that they aren't just attacking the first person who comes along. They're looking for the, our adventurers, our heroes, and they're hiding in wait, but they know, at least they think that the characters are going to come down that pathway at some time in that day. So maybe they've got, you know, some traps set up. Maybe there's a, you know, a, a rope trap to catch somebody's leg and pull them up into the air and most people wouldn't notice it. And so as the heroes walk by, you know, oh, no, the ropes got them. And then then they jump out and attack. Uh, you can kind of set the stage. And there's a bunch of different things you can do. You know, traps are one of them. I think that's a fun one for me, at least. Um, you could also do different challenges. You know, if you're fighting on, let's say, a, a mountain, right? And every so often, the DM can make a roll just to determine how the, how the situation, the atmosphere is going. And maybe it turns out this mountain is actually a volcano. And oh man, now it's erupting, you know. So that that adds like a whole other level of complexity, not just for the players, but for the the uh, monsters, NPCs, whatever you want to call them, uh, the the bad guys. That adds a whole other level of complexity to the fight because as the fight continues, you're going to see some lava, you're going to see some ash, you're going to see rocks tumbling down the mountain, you know, and maybe they got to dodge out of the way or they got to run for cover or what have you. So I think there's a lot of lot you can do. Basically, just let your imagination go wild. You know, you can sky's the limits. Add stuff that you want to you want to add. Um, and lastly, what is one piece of advice that you would give to either a player or a DM about combat? Oh well, uh, I would definitely say, and this has happened to me before. Uh, do not be afraid to ask for clarification. Okay. Uh, you know, a lot of the times, some people use miniatures for combat, which is great, mm -hmm. uh, and that can really help kind of set the stage. Like, oh, I'm here, and this guy's here. Uh, but some, not everyone does. Some people just use their imagination. So if there's something you're unclear on, definitely both as a player and a DM, make sure you ask for clarification. That way you're not like, well, I'm right next to him. What's the big deal? And someone's like, no, you're way over there. What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> it, it just kind of, you know, can help head some of those conflicts off at the past. That's the frustration when you think you're somewhere and you may be somewhere else or somebody else thinks that you're somewhere else, if that makes sense. sense. Um, so I think uh, communication is definitely key and, and don't be afraid to ask questions in terms of uh player advice i would say don't like don't always feel like you need to do what's optimal uh mm -hmm. i think there is some some disagreeances on this but uh for me at least i would much rather have a player do something that they think is risky and fun uh you know so maybe they want to do like a backflip off of a box and then stab like the stab guy the instead guy. of just walking up and stabbing the guy uh yeah why not you know if you screw that up <laughs> Okay, sure, it's kind of embarrassing and your character lands on their butt, but uh, if you pull it Next off, it's, good, it's going to be super cool. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to risk it a little bit. Uh, and DMs, kind of the same, you know, don't be afraid to throw things at your players that you think are cool. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to invest yourself into the fight, uh, but at the same time, be prepared to adapt as you need to. Be flexible, I would say. Excellent. Flexibility is always good. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dane, for um, for doing this interview with me. Um, if you're looking for more information on the Boise Comic Arts Festival, you can head to our website, which is boisepubliclibrary.org slash bcaf. It's awesome. Check it out. It's a great time.
and thank you for having me.